Hello everybody and welcome back to the Ultimate Fashion History with me, fashion historian and costume consultant Amanda Halley. I am recording this on Saturday, September 17th and on Monday the British will bury their Queen. And I am very sensitive to just how much Queen Elizabeth II meant to so many people not just in the United Kingdom, but all around the world. And I'm also sensitive to the emails that I received from so many of you saying, hey Amanda, are you going to do a little episode on Elizabeth to mark her passing? The day that Queen Elizabeth died, I was on vacation with my husband and not on internet doing the ultimate fashion history and stuff like that. But Tom, who is one of the UFH social media administrators on our Facebook group, created an announcement on behalf of the UFH, which I think is so perfect. And I want to share part of it with you here because it explains my feelings about this so perfectly. From the new look to the new millennium, Elizabeth was a true 20th century style icon. And no matter what your opinion of the monarchy is, it is indisputable that this marks the end of an era. And it really does because, love her or not so much, Elizabeth II was part of our cultural landscape for 70 years. Well, 96 if you go back to the year of her birth. And so her passing does mark the end of an era. So in this episode, I wanted to go back to the very start of that era, to her coronation day, and that incredible gown designed for her by Norman Hartnell in this episode of That Dress. Queen Elizabeth's coronation dress was of course designed by royal couturier Norman Hartnell and I'm basing most of this episode on his own words on the subject drawn from his truly delightful autobiography Silver and Gold. The coronation took place on June 2nd 1953 and it was an event that exceeded the passing of a crown in cultural importance. It was seen as very much the start of a new and modern Britain, an optimistic fresh start after the ravages of war, a war that hit Britain particularly cruelly. And I'll be talking about this period of history in the United Kingdom in an upcoming feature episode that I'm really, really excited about. Britain Before the Beatles, a new interpretation of why England swung. So subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, so you don't miss that one. The coronation also marked the start of the television age in Great Britain. The coronation, as you know, was broadcast live and television ownership evidently jumped from 800,000 to 3.2 million in the United Kingdom. Most of those people buying their first TV specifically to watch the coronation. Remember, Britain was still operating under the ration in 1953, yet the sugar and margarine allowances were increased for the week of the coronation as a special treat. So that people could bake cakes and have street parties to celebrate the coronation, and every kid got a coronation mug to mark the occasion. So this was a big, big deal, and Norman Hartnell knew what a big deal it was. The date for the coronation was set the previous October, and although he didn't know for sure until he was asked directly by the Queen that he would be the guy to design the dress, the world was correct to speculate that Hartnell would be tasked with designing her gown. Let's see what Hartnell himself wrote about the moment he was asked directly by the Queen to design her coronation gown. It's charming. I can scarcely remember what I murmured in reply. In simple conversational tones, the Queen went on to express her wishes. Her Majesty required that the dress should conform in line to that of her wedding dress, and the material should be in white satin. 
It was almost exactly five years earlier that I had put the final touches to the dress which, as Princess Elizabeth, she had worn on the day of her wedding to the Duke of Edinburgh. So, of course, Hartnell designed her wedding dress, which she loved, and she wanted the coronation dress to evoke, to echo the spirit of the wedding dress, and, wow, he certainly gave her what she wanted. For here's the wedding dress and here's the coronation dress. And yes, we can see that the wedding dress owes more to the late 1940s silhouette with its flared skirt and the coronation dress's pure new look. But in terms of palette and textile and spirit, the two gowns are remarkably similar, although the coronation gown wasn't in satin as requested, but ultimately in silk. Hartnell had been working for the royal family for quite some time. He was the favoured couturier of her mother, Queen Elizabeth, who became Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and his extremely feminine creations for her struck just the right note in the 1930s. In fact, I'd say that it was a combination of Hartnell's gowns and Cecil Beaton's photography that culminated in the fantastic PR job they did for the royal family, this gentle and fairy tale image they created, restoring a positive public image of the royal family after the abdication of Edward VIII and the striking but often quite severe sartorial stylings of Wallace Simpson. Yet today, many fashion historians and fashion critics are quick to secretly disparage the work of Norman Hartnell. They say it's all bells and whistles, and that he relied far too much on embellishment and embroidery and sequins and paillettes and bugle beads and lace and trim, and that if you strip all of this away, you're not left with much of interest, and that all of the embellishment disguises what are pretty unremarkable dresses with very basic tailoring. Well, I'm going to jump to Norman Hartnell's defense with Exhibit A. His wedding dress for Princess Margaret, noted for its elegant simplicity and impeccable tailoring, embellishment kept to an absolute minimum to enhance the gown's beautiful lines. It has to be remembered that Hartnell was a couturier and by all accounts a very obliging one. He was noted for working incredibly closely with his clients and giving them whatever they wanted. And if they wanted more bugle beads, more crystal, more rhinestone, more feathers, he was more than happy to oblige. They were paying after all. And I feel that Hartnell operated under the idea that the customer is always right, even when they're not. Another criticism that's been leveled at Norman Hartnell is that he basically just ripped off Christian Dior. Well, so did everybody else. Balmain, Jacques Fat, Givenchy. Dior created a truly new silhouette and approach to fashion with the new look. This cinch-waisted, uber-feminine, romantic and nostalgic approach to the mid-century female fashion look that was embraced by everybody at every level of fashion retail. So if Hartnell hadn't embraced the new look, He'd have looked terribly out of step, and when he was good, he was really good. Look at these beautiful evening gowns. Look at that evening coat. Look at the scalloped bust line on the gown on the left and the bodice of the gown on the right. These are beautiful, and they really speak to Hartnell's understanding that less can often be more as well as his true understanding instinctively of color. But when customizing these gowns for clients, one can only imagine their demands and how these dresses may have ended up looking on the back of a British aristocrat stuck in the outmoded belief that more was never less and the more crap you put on a dress, the more fashionable you were. Yet Elizabeth, whose personal taste in clothing was unextravagant, made for the perfect client for Norman Hartnell. His designs for her in the first era of her reign striking the perfect note, falling as they did between high fashion and regal modesty. The Queen always looked in step with fashion, but never the victim of it. Hartnell understanding instinctively that the focus should always be on the woman and not what she was wearing. Yet what she was wearing always had to be appropriate to Elizabeth's role in life 
and to her duties. And given the excellent job he had done with royal fashion prior to the coronation, he was not only the obvious choice, but perhaps the only choice to design her coronation dress. And here's what he wrote in his autobiography about he set to the task. Quote, After gathering all the factual material I could, I then retired to the seclusion of Windsor Forest and there spent many days making trial sketches. My mind was teeming with heraldic and floral ideas. I thought of lilies, roses, marguerites and golden corn. I thought of altar cloths and sacred vestments. I thought of the sky, the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, and everything heavenly that might be embroidered upon a dress destined to be historic. And historic it certainly was. Here it is on display and housed as if it's the Holy Grail. Yet instantly recognizable though it is, it isn't the dress that Hartnell first thought he'd be designing because he assumed that the dress would be pure white. And it isn't. And here's what he has to say about that. I mentioned that the gown of Queen Victoria was all white, but Her Majesty pointed out that at the time of her coronation in 1838, Queen Victoria was only 18 years old and unmarried, whereas she herself was older and a married woman. Therefore, the restrictions imposed upon the gown of Queen Victoria did not apply to her own. I then drew a facsimile of the chosen sketch and enjoyed the pleasure known to all artists of painting the small rainbow touches of pastel colours into a penciled black and white drawing. Isn't that a lovely sentiment and idea and image. When we look at the dress today, we don't really think of it as having any colour, do we? But it was imbued with so many lovely touches that you can see here in a close-up, copper and bronze and lavender and sage green and yellow, really quite vibrant colours. Although the gown has been cared for beautifully over the past 70 years, I suspect that these colours have actually faded over time. And if you take a look at this image here, and if we zoom in a bit, I imagine that on that day in 1953, this embroidery was far more vibrant than it is today. Hartnell created eight or nine sketches for the coronation dress. The one that he preferred was evidently a very simple shift dress. I couldn't find an image of it or a facsimile of his sketch, but ultimately he was very pleased with the final sketch, which is the one that the Queen chose. And with true diplomacy, he went on to say that that was his favourite as well. For the body of the gown, the silk came from Britain's first silk farm in Lullingston Castle, established by Lady Hart Dyke. And the cloth was woven by Warner and Sons in Essex, the silk specialist that had woven the coronation robes for King Edward VII. And look how beautifully tailored this gown is. Look at the back and this fluted effect. It's absolutely gorgeous. When you see the dress with all of the embellishment removed, you get a feel for just how pretty it was in unto itself with this sweetheart neckline, short sleeves, tucked waist and full new look skirt. But of course it is the embroidery and the beading and the applique that makes it so very special. Those very elements for which Hartnell is sometimes criticized, he is applauded for here and quite rightly. The gown was covered in over a 100,000 seed pearls to create a latticed effect and then embroidered with flowers, plants and vegetables symbolic of the Queen's dominion. It featured the Tudor Rose of England, Scottish thistles, shamrocks for Northern Ireland, the wattle of Australia, maple leaves for Canada, ferns from New Zealand, South Africa's protea, two lotus flowers for India and Sri Lanka, and Pakistan's wheat, cotton and jute all embroidered in various colours, some appliqued with coloured tissue, and the threads throughout were gold and silver bullion. 
But Hartnell himself was a little confused when it came to the symbol of Wales. He assumed that the official Welsh national flower or vegetable was the daffodil, and his preliminary embroidery sketches featured beautiful daffodils. Now, of course, he had to run all of this past the Garter King of Arms, who's in charge of all of the official heraldry and symbols of the monarchy. And this is what Hartnell wrote about the occasion when he went to the Garter of Arms to ask for official images of the Welsh daffodil. A daffodil, exclaimed Garter. On no account will I give you a daffodil. I will give you the correct emblem of Wales, which is the leek. The leek, I agreed, was a most admirable vegetable, full of historic significance, and doubtless of health-giving properties, but scarcely noted for its beauty. Could he not possibly permit me to use the more graceful daffodil instead? No, Hartnell, you must have the leek said Garter, adamant, and evidently poor Norman was a little depressed at this prospect, but then he went to the vegetable garden at Windsor and saw that leeks, when they're in bloom, are actually very beautiful. And I think that what you see here is his embroidered interpretation of the leek because the vegetable part, of course, is underground, but when they bloom, they have this seed sack at the top, like a little fluffy cloud. Really very pretty, and this cheered Norman up tremendously. Yet, Norman did secretly add a little bit of unauthorized embroidery all by himself. He very sweetly had a four-leaf clover embroidered on the dress for good luck, and he placed it so that Elizabeth's hand would fall upon it when she had her arms down. This was such a sweet gesture. The embroideries were arranged in three scalloped graduated tiers bordered with alternating lines of gold bugle beads, diamante, and pearls. The dress is said to weigh between 11 and 15 pounds, depending on the source you read. The dress took eight months to make, and that includes research, design, and workmanship, and required the efforts of at least three dressmakers and six embroideresses drawn from the Royal School of Needlework. The gown cost between 37 and 38 thousand pounds, which is what, 40, 41 thousand dollars, but it got more than one outing. Elizabeth wore this gown five or six other times to open parliaments in New Zealand and Australia, stuff like that. So she did at least get her money's worth out of it, I guess. The robe, that beautiful long cloak, was made by Ede and Ravenscroft in English silk and is decorated with 18 different types of gold thread with embroidered wheat ears and olive branches, meant to symbolize prosperity and peace for Elizabeth's reign. Now, I wasn't going to talk about the crown or any of the jewelry in this episode, but I was really intrigued by these bracelets. I'll zoom in so you can get a better look. These enormous chunky bangles that she's wearing. They look rather incongruous, don't they? They look so modern, like they should be on the wrist of a beatnik or something. I had to find out about them, so I did a bit of research. And here they are. They are called armels, and they represent wisdom and sincerity for Elizabeth's reign. The coronation of Elizabeth II really saw a turning point in British history. It was seen as an optimistic, fresh start. The day really was a joyful celebration. And because of it, not only did it place televisions in the homes of most British people, but it gave the world coronation chicken. If you're British, you probably eat coronation chicken all the time. 
But if you aren't, you might not be familiar with this. One of my personal favourite things to eat. It was invented for the royals and the swells for their coronation day lunch at Buck Palace. And it's sort of a creamy curry chicken with apricots and raisins and stuff. You can have it in a salad or better yet, a coronation chicken sandwich really is the queen of sandwiches. They're so good. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode here on The Ultimate Fashion History. Remember, I don't do comments here on YouTube, but I will leave all of my details. And if you want to chat about all of this stuff, join the Ultimate Fashion History Facebook group. If you are a fan of vintage fiction, join the Dean Street Press Facebook group. That's our publishing company. I'll be back very soon with more on the UFH, including Britain Before the Beatles, which I'm really excited about. So don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thanks ever so much for watching. Bye for now.